Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Neo Tokyo's official podcast, Interlinked, powered by Shrapnel and Crypto Unicorns. Brace yourself for impact, crypto gamers. I am reporting from the Sacrifice Zone. STX3 just wrapped up, and it was chock full of new features. One of those new features is the addition of weapon skin fragments. Scattered all over the map, in drawers, in boxes, on your dead opponents, there were weapon skin fragments that you could extract and then combine to create new weapon skins and bring those to the marketplace or strap them onto your favorite weapon and hop back into the sacrifice zone. They also added Metal, their off-chain point reward system, and some killer map updates. Can't wait to dive back into the Shadow Zone on June 24th for STX 3.1. Introducing Crypto Unicorns, a play and collect game by Laguna Games. Breed, battle, and collect your favorite unicorns. Crypto Unicorns has recently successfully migrated to the Xi blockchain. The Xi blockchain was custom developed leveraging Arbitrum technology to address the needs of Web3 gaming at scale. Stay tuned to the end of this episode to learn all about Crypto Unicorn's Play to Airdrop campaign, which just kicked off on July 1st. Learn all about this and more at www.cryptounicorns.fun. Huge shout out to our sponsor, Playable Games. They are inspired by gamers and funded by their community. They have a Epic game on the Epic Game Store, a third-person shooter called Nexus. Hop on in there and check that out. They're also currently selling nodes, so if you're interested, check that out at their website, playable.games. That is a three instead of a B on playable. Now strap in for the rest of this episode of Interlinked. We are joined today by my amazing co-hosts, Jared and Ben. How are we doing, guys? Great. Ground. So glad to be here. It's the best day in the world to be a cartoon character, LARPing as a uh, professional businessman here, talking about crypto gaming and having fun, and accidentally pushing forward the entire world through crypto gaming together as a unit with you guys as part of the gaming Illuminati. So here we are. Bang, bang. Absolutely love it. Uh, and we are also joined by Forever Tipsy, the CEO and founder of the Tipsy Company. How are we doing today, Tipsy? Hey, guys. Uh, thanks for having me over here. I'm doing great. Um, Forever Tipsy, darling, in from Singapore. Um, always bursting with energy, man. Oh, I absolutely love it because it's got to be late there in Singapore. So we appreciate you staying up for us. Um, let's dive into it. Give us a nice rundown on the tipsy company uh you know we've got plenty of long form time here on the podcast so feel free to dive into the details sounds awesome yeah I two ways to look at it late or early um i go with the former so almost 6 a.m but hey you know we are, we are united by um one time zone right the the time zone of the tipsy world um so we have two games under our umbrella right now one is um gate of abyss uh, and it's a location-based RPG. So, you know, think of character progression, think of being able to explore the world, defeating monsters, capturing outposts, um, really leaving your mark on that game, um, turn-based combat. So, you know, we, we're taking Pokemon Go like, like a notch up, man. The whole uh, blockchain aspect, the whole Web3 thing, you know, we want to ease players into this technology so we make it really optional. Um, game is available to play for free on both Android and iOS uh, on the stores. And the second game, Noir Frontier, it's it's a space game, you know, intergalactic space combat, base management. Um, a couple more exciting features going to be rolled out uh, in the next few months. Um, super kick-ass graphics also on um, both platforms and available to play for free. Oh, I absolutely love it. So maybe we tackle them w one at a time. Let's dive into Nova Frontier first. Um, could you give, you know, I know you gave just a brief detail, but let's dive into it. Let's open it up, explain it to the audience, paint a word picture for anyone who hasn't gotten a chance to play. Uh, and we'll dive into the details from there. Sounds amazing. So, you know, you open up this game 
Um, you have a free spaceship given to you. Um, we believe in the whole free-to-play mechanism, you know, no throwing of ads to the users so they can really immerse themselves in the game, um, can get into quick play mode to just really hone your skills, uh, you can get into tournament modes, you know, play some bets, get a share of the prize pool if you defeat your enemies, um, if you outdo other players. Um, we are, uh, at the moment, it's largely PvE, so kind of player versus environment. Um, you you can expect to navigate your spaceship a bit like a flight sim concept. Um, just, you know, kind of maneuvering it around, um, avoiding obstacles, you know, shooting enemies, uh, real time. You have got your turrets, you've got your missiles if you want more action coming to play. Um, you really need to work on those reflexes, man, because this game is fast paced. It's 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 just bursting with a lot of energy, um, and we are looking to to take it a notch uh, higher with the with the whole gameplay combat. Um, we are going to look at PvP, so kind of a clash of clans st style. I'm I'm really excited to unveil this. Um, at the moment, we are working on being able to upgrade spaceships. Um, we have our integrated marketplace. So a lot of the features can be done on our web app as well. Um, and as we get into the game being deeper, um, just, just you know, wanting to really lure players in, the whole base management thing requires a lot of uh, a strategic gameplay. So being able to place, you know, turrets um, to shoot down, uh, to shoot, shoot down our enemies and so on, fortresses, now all of that will be coming into play as well. And maybe to take a quick step back, so we set a little bit more of a foundation on the Tipsy Company. Could you flesh out a little bit of the history there? Um, you know how the Tipsy Company came into being. Uh, maybe touch upon how big the team is and some of the other big players that are uh, you know building these two universes uh, with you. Sounds amazing, man. Um, so Tipsy Company was started in late 2021. Um, just you know, wanting to build a, a nice gaming ecosystem to unify players. Um, we initially dived uh, deep into the whole Minecraft world, uh, wanting to offer an immersive experience beyond plain vanilla, um, the custom built Minecraft server. Um, but hey, the, the, the ecosystem is actually really complex, right? So we have a native cryptocurrency called Tipsy Coin. Um, there's just good vibes, man. And, and you you can get tipsy coin, it's a deflationary token, so no more new tokens are being issued. It's not something that is just being minted every second as we speak. In fact, you know, it was um kind of a fair launch, uh, no pre-sales. Um, we don't use um standard smart contracts, so everything was custom built. It's on the BNB chain, uh, but we are going to look to expand to ETH mainnet and so on. So you can stake Tipsy Coin, um, which is our governance token. You can stake, stake it for something called JIN, which is uh, the, the cross-game utility token um, for all the games that we launch. So I spoke about Minecraft a few moments back, but we quickly transitioned out into the mobile gaming space um, because in 2022, uh, Microsoft um, disallowed kind of blockchain integration within Minecraft. And, and so we moved on from there. You know, we still wanted to, to unify players, bring them together. And I strongly believe in being able to offer players true possession of their assets. And that's what Web3 Gaming is all about, right? I mean, players, you know, spending, uh, spending money on things they just love, they just like to develop a connection, an emotional attachment with these items. And it's only fair they're able to use them. They're able to, to trade them and monetize them if they want to. You know, you don't want to be able to restrict them. And I think gaming is just, just literally the best way uh, to pave utility into this space, to onboard the masses into the world of Web3. Um, right. So I speak gaming, 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 man. And I mean, you know, out from the Minecraft thing, it, it, it quickly morphed into um, mobile because of, of just the level of adoption um, mobile gaming has. Right. You look at a lot of developing countries that has just insane number of users around the world in gaming space. These guys don't have desktops. They don't have, you know, fully specced out laptops, but they all have these phones they, they live out of it, they, you know, they, they work, they play, they, everything is, is in their palms, right? So, so we looked at, you know, very quickly, just, just get a bit from there and, and it has its own uh, little development course. Um, and, and further down the road, we acquired 
uh, Nova Frontier, of course, before it was called Nova Frontier. And then you kind of rebranded it, developed a little bit more of it. And so now we have these two babies, man, under under the ecosystem uh, and, and a lot more. I mean, a bunch of other assets which we'll get into later. Um, but yeah, Tipsy Coin and Jinnah just literally, um, you know, we just literally at, at the tip of the iceberg now. But yeah, this this thing is just fun. And uh, could you touch on some of the rest of the team? Um, like how big are the uh, the dev teams that are working on these games? Um, you know, the blockchain devs, other people in sort of the management. If you could paint a picture of a little bit of the the structure of the Tipsy company and the players. Yeah, of course, Nick. Sounds great. Um, so it's a team right now, you know, we're kind of about 30-ish if you include the advisors that we have. Um, I mean, I'm based in Singapore as, as the founder and CEO, um, but the team is super dynamic. I mean, we have Web3 guys, you know, from Australia to New York to Pakistan, a mix of uh, Solidity guys, uh, some front-end guys. Um, and the, the gaming guys are largely based in Vietnam, in Hanoi. So we have two separate gaming teams for both games. But we also have guys who work across... Um, not just the game development per se, um, because because gaming has its own um it, gaming has own complexities to deal with, right? You talk about game design, you talk about gaming economies, you're talking about 2D, 3D stuff, you know, animation, you talk about storylines. Uh, so so all of that, you know, kind of stays in place. But we also have an overlapping uh team for both games. Um, because we believe in um the the cross pollination of players across both our games, right? And if and if you own assets, um, they're not just confined to one game, but you can use them across both our games. So there is that kind of um that level of player retention, and that's how I feel Web three games can have an edge over Web two games. Um, you know, just just players being able to utilize their assets across more than one game. Um, we have our CEO, um, John Zen, uh, he's now based in the UAE, he's Canadian, um, but, you know, we have a subsidiary in the UAE, the company is formerly incorporated in Marshall Islands. So it's, it's really global. You know, we, we have a bunch of, um, we, we call them executives. Think of them as kind of a very active board of director, uh, a role. They, they have equity, they've skinned the game as well. Um, most of the guys, uh, in, in this team, are based in the US, uh, some in Canada as well. Um, we we have you know amazing board. I mean, a lot of credit to them. You know, huge shout out to them as well. Always, always very supporting and loving. Um, now, for example, Josh Ong, um, whom I think many of um you guys in Web three might be familiar with. You know, he's advisor to Yuga Labs. He's he's also on our board. Um, so yeah, and I mean, you know, we all just come together and and we building out this community. Um, of of players and you know we want to really be we want to be a, an active gaming community that spans beyond Web three. We don't want to just speak blockchain and I think we we need to speak gaming. We need to onboard players regardless of whether it's Web two, whether it's Web three. The games have to be fun to play. So so yeah, that's our mantra. That's fantastic. I was wondering if you could go into a little bit of what the um, uses are for Gen versus what the uses are for Tipsy Coin. I know you can uh, stake Tipsy to get Gen, but what are the uses in game between those? Yeah, so uh, that's a great question, um, Jared. So Tipsy Coin has got um, no utility within the games itself because it's a governance token. The whole idea of having a, a dual currency mechanism, you know, one is supposed to be a governance style deflationary, um, but such a mechanism would not work for a gaming ecosystem if it's purely deflationary because as the player base grows, if you have a single, a sole deflationary currency, then things in game just becomes more and more expensive. And this would uh, deter players from, you know, from especially newer players from joining and playing because um, they would come in at a disadvantage. Uh, so that's where Jin comes into play because uh, Tipsy Coin holders, they can stake the Tipsy Coin to get free Jin. They use the, the Jin, you know, um, across uh, both games in different, uh, different ways. So in Gator Base, you know, you can buy a bunch of stuff. Right? You talk about gear, you talk about being able to upgrade stuff in uh, in your blacksmiths, you talk about being able to build construct buildings and so on. You you need gin. Um, but we we stay away from the whole pay to win mechanism. Um, without a doubt, though, I mean, if you do have some gin, you would have an, an edge, you'd have an advantage. But this does not give you a guarantee of uh dominating throughout the game because in Gate of Abyss. 
Um, you have gin, yes, but you also have another currency called gold. Uh, right. So, so we kind of want to strike a, a little nice balance because you you don't have you know a, a newbie coming into the game just throwing ten or twenty grand, you know, being able to buy everything and trumping over everybody. That just destroys the gaming spirit, man. So I think it's all about finding the right balance. Um, now in one frontier, the same thing. You know, you can use gin, you can convert it to 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 crystals, um, dark Nova crystals. You can use these crystals to upgrade your spaceships and so on. So it's it's, it's largely centered around gin being um, the premium currency for all the games uh, within the Tipsy ecosystem. Um, and you know, before I dive deep into the other assets, I just like to casually mention um, we have a few NFT collections. Uh, we have one which we consider the flagship NFT collection. It's um, the Genesis Penguins. I mean, hey, you know, you know, penguins waddle. They're just cute. They're good vibes. Um, when you think of penguins, you think of um, stuff like Happy Feet, right? It's just adorable. It just puts a smile on your face. Um, and and again, you know, these penguins, um, you can use uh, them in get of a base. You can send them out to farm for rewards, or you can equip them, and they help you fight in battles. Um, in our frontier, you could tag these penguins a spaceship, and you know they they just kind of provide a boost to your to your gameplay. Um, and we have other we have other NFTs as well. I mean, uh, spaceships and uh and, and so on and uh, land as well, real estate. Um, but we'll get into that later. Okay, and uh, I also see that you can actually buy those penguins directly from your website. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. So we've actually just launched our, our marketplace, a Tipsy Marketplace. Um, right now the penguins are on the Ethereum mainnet. Um, you know, they, they, they sit at a floor price of something like 0.06 ETH. Um, you know, obviously the markets have had a bit of correction, but I mean, ultimately we are grateful, um, for, for this demand. I mean, there's still a, a great demand for these penguins and considering our games are still in a bit of a early access mode, you know, we have a nice, uh, closely knit community of players, um, that, that goes in, in the hundreds. I mean, hundreds of daily active users, not a very big deal in the grand scheme of things, but I mean, that number is already 99% more than most Web3 games. Um, and I know we should not be complacent about that because I think, you know, when you want to peg yourself as, as being a successful uh, Web3 game, then you benchmark against the best of Web2 titles. And, and you know, you don't compare a, a, against a game that has got 20 players and say, oh, hey, we're better than them. No, man. I mean, we, you know, we always need to do better. We want to be able to, to ensure there's sufficient content in the games. You keep developing, you keep rolling on your stuff. Players keep, you know, being just being excited. And I think just in general, our whole strategy has evolved over time. Um, you know, like um, from the Minecraft thing, which you guys know of, um, we we also, with Get Over Base, we initially started out by contracting a gaming studio to develop the game for us, and they ditched us halfway. Um, so we, we, we took it in our own hands. We developed a gaming uh, studio, kind of just our own team, you know, just just rebuild a bunch of foundations. And then, yeah, it was just, you know, continually evolving. We had our spaceship sale some months ago. It did not go as, as planned. I mean, obviously, the market's cooled off again. But we just keep building, man. I mean, how many projects in the space can say they've been around um, for something like, you know, 30, 32 months or, or so now? So, yeah, for us, uh, that's a feat. And, you know, we will be here for the next decade and two and three and four. And, and yeah, man, you know, just building this thing out there. Yeah, and uh, on that Genesis NFT and, and the uh, spaceships as well, could you explain uh, what your vision is for them and the ecosystem and like what sort of utility they have to date? Yeah, sounds great. So with the penguins, um, they are, you know, kind of very clear cut NFTs. Uh, like I said, they're on the mainnet. Um, so we, we want to continue rolling out additional utility uh, for all of the assets in our ecosystem, whether it's for the tokens or whether it's for the NFTs or, or the other assets. Uh, so for the penguins, you can look forward uh, to additional experiences, additional features within both games. Um, like I said, you know, you can already use them to, to deploy them uh, in, in adventures uh, for farming or just equip them as a pet and they help you fight and, and get of abyss. Uh, in all fronts, you can tag them to a spaceship and they, they help you. They basically provide a boost in stats and attack and defense capabilities uh, and so on. And um, that, that's for the penguins and for the spaceships. Um, you know, as as it says, it's, it's largely uh, it was largely centered around Nova Frontier, but I believe 
that um, the beauty about Web3 gaming is that the cross-pollination of players across other games, obviously to do that, you, uh, the company must have more than one game, right? So that's where we are, man. We have two games right now and, and you know, we are, we are growing, we are building. I, I envision us having three, four, five titles down the road. Um, DS is being used across all of these games. Um, so spaceships like right now, you use them mostly in our frontier, but we will be introducing um, kind of a spaceship uh, a crossover in terms of utility within Gate of Abyss. So just, you know, for example, and, and and just just to illustrate some potential here, you know, being able to summon your spaceships uh, in the middle of a game, you know, ordering an airstrike uh, to your enemies in Gate of Abyss, right? So um, the way these um, assets turn up in the game, the way you know they they they, they function, in the game may differ from asset to asset um, because these assets will have to follow the the the, the graphic style of the different games. So penguins in Gate of a Base can feel a bit more you know childlike as compared to in Noah Frontier, which is called more serious you know fully fleshed out graphics. Um, but ultimately, the whole idea is, uh, is uh, cross pollination of players. Now, spaceships per se, um, I mentioned that the games are free to play. So, no, you don't need to acquire a spaceship to play Noah Frontier. You know, you start with a free ship. Um, you 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 even able to create your accounts. You know, for both games uh, within the game client. So, literally, you just get your hands on these titles by downloading them from the App Store or the or the Play Store. Create your account, and then. If you want to go through the whole web free experience, you get into the web apps, um, you log in with the same credentials and then connect your wallets and so on. So if you want to buy a spaceship, then you're welcome to. Uh, and, and then they do not, these spaceships, when you buy them, they are not native NFTs. Um, so we have introduced a term, you know, called soft NFTs, uh, j just for our community to be able to partake in being able to own assets that are off chain. If they want to bring it on chain, they can initiate a min mint function. So the spaceships uh, were initially envisioned for the Ethereum uh, mainnet, but then we switched over to the Arbitrum networks. And I know that, you know, we're also building out our relationship with the Arbitrum team. So, th so there's a lot more coming up. Um, we also have land, uh, real estate. So if you look at, at Goa land, for example, um, you know, get up a base is a location-based RPG, right? So the game map is a one-to-one -one reflection of where you're, uh, where you're in. I mean, in, the, in this world. So if you're in New York, you're standing in Times Square, you pull up the game. Um, you're literally in the Times Square version of, of Get Up Abyss and, you know, a bit of a of an AR concept over there. Of, um, you know, you see monsters, you see portals around you in the game and, and you, you know, you can defeat them and so on. But if you own land, let's say you own some real estate in Vancouver and you're in Times Square, um, you can literally teleport to your, to your land in Vancouver within the game itself. How cool is that? And you can go hunt for mobs over there, you know, look for maybe more exclusive drops around the world. Um, even leave your mark by constructing buildings and so on. And owning land, you know, also gives you an advantage because you, you're able to build vanity structures and so on. And um, this land, like 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 the name says, you know, Goa land, it's largely centered around Get of Abyss, but because being a web-free gaming ecosystem, we want to promote, you know, this whole cross-utility mechanism. Uh, you can stake your land for things like, you know, Dark Nova crystals. And these Dark Nova crystals can be used to upgrade your spaceships in our frontier. So everything kind of links together. And, and this land also exists um, as an asset off-chain. If you want to bring it on-chain, you can just initiate a mint function um, you know, within, within our platforms or web apps. And the, the price of the, the Goa land, is it based on, say, New York more expensive than, say, Michigan? Or is it looks like the same price for everything? Is that correct? Oh, yeah, great question. Um, so in the primary market, yes, they're priced the same. Um, but on secondary market, you know, I, I would say that um, premium locations are going for a bit of a premium. Um, it's, it's really up to the users. You know, it's just up to your discretion how they want to price it. Um, at the moment, the, the community, you know, I mean, our DAUs is still in the hundreds. So it's, it's, it's rather active within the space. Um, but we want to grow. And, and as we do, we'll see a number of transactions. We see a demand on secondary marketplaces as well going up. Um, we are also, you know, we, we've kind of built out our own uh, marketplace. We just launched it and, you know, we're still kind of um, ironing out some bugs, but I mean, it's, it's largely very functional. The whole idea is to allow uh, Web2 users to be on board into the world Web3 seamlessly. So even being able to transact with these assets using their credit card and then all these conversions, you know, whether it's to USDC, whether it's to ETH. And so on happening uh, back end. Um, so we work with um, you know custom marketplaces uh, solutions like Altura, like Snag, 
Um, and, and I know we, we, you know, we have a, we have a few dollars we're looking to work with as well. So it's it's just nice, you know, being able to bring these games um, to to the eyes of of millions and millions of players around the world. I mean, that's our objective. And whatever you know, and and whatever path the assets take, you know, uh, in terms of transactions, in terms of the volume, that's all our secondary focus, right? Our primary focus is really on the whole gameplay element. Um, and I think even the whole monetization model has evolved over time. Um, the concept of one-off NFT launches is not sustainable as we've seen across different projects. The concept of token launches are also you know, not really sustainable. The whole you know, valuation thing, uh, TGEs, airdrops. I mean, players are not supposed to play games you know, to farm airdrops. Like the true spirit of gaming is just playing to have fun. And as we all know, Players spend the money when they when they're having fun. They enjoying games. You know, you touch on that emotional, irrational aspect. So right now we're going down the uh, the huge traditional route of monetization through in app purchases, where players can just spend on on in game stuff. Uh, you know, with a with a with a button or two, with touch of a button or two. Um, your Apple, you know, Google Pay kind of stuff. Now a word from our sponsors. Introducing Creo Engine, a next level Web3 gaming ecosystem that connects gamers and developers in a Web3 gaming hub. Hop on their Creo Play platform to check out current and upcoming titles like Evermore Nights, Slime Haven, Creonia Metaverse, and Arcade Fest. The team has earned the endorsement of the chairman of Indonesia's People Consultative Assembly and earned a 10 out of 10 from Hacken on their cross-chain bridge audit. Check all this out and more on CreoEngine.com. Introducing Redodo, gambling infrastructure that offers seamless on-chain experiences. I'm excited to announce that Redodo is the first real GambleFi project to be listed on not just one, but two major centralized exchanges, BitMart and Mexi. Hop on their fully decentralized platform for lotteries, casino games, and betting. No KYC, no deposits, and instant payouts all fueled by their RDT token, enabling you to play, build your own casino games, and bankroll as the house. Check all this out and more at redodo.io. Now back, back to, to your regularly, regularly scheduled, scheduled program. program. And to uh, swing back to the launch of the spaceships and the NFT sale, uh, we obviously cater the show to the Web3 Gamer, but of course, Neo Tokyo is chock full of founders. So for the other founders that'll be listening to this, what were some of the big lessons that you learned um, from that sale, which, as you mentioned, didn't live up to your expectations? Obviously, market's a super important factor, and you know this is the ocean in which all of these things swim. But what were some of the big takeaways that you could share with some of the other founders? Yeah, that's a great question, uh, Nick, and I'm, I'm happy to um, to share. So- we positioned our, our spaceship launch as kind of, you know, like like I said, nature of the assets that we've launched um, are friendly for both Web2 and Web3 markets. Uh, these spaceships are not necessarily NFTs in their native form. So how do you communicate something like this to players? And because we were catering for both, both Web2 and Web3 markets, to the Web3 users, they are like, hey, when is the mint date, for example? We were like, no, no, there's no mint date. There's a launch date. And people will be like, hey, is there a whitelist campaign? I'll give you my wallet address. They'll be like, no, there's no whitelist campaign. You know, I mean, it's 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 kind of a traditional e-commerce model that we went down the route. But for the web to user, it was not a very traditional um model because in terms of pricing, you know, the the, the spaceship started at, you know, let's say $200, uh, even after the early bid discount, a $200 for an entry-level spaceship. Now, that's a lot of money for the average gamer in the web to world. They're like, hey, you know, 200 bucks, you can usually buy a full-fledged game on, on your console or your PC or whatever or not. Um, or, you know, you, you spend that kind of money in game and you get a lot of progress. But, hey, our premium spaceships were going for $5,000 after a 50% discount. So for the Web2 user, they're like, what the hell, why the hell would I pay $5,000 for, for a game, uh, for gaming assets, you know, especially it's a new title out in the market. For the Web3 user, they see differently because of $5,000 into an NFT is an investment. Right, it's it's limited by numbers. It's it's a validated blockchain transaction. You know that this company is not selling tens of millions of ships, but it's selling ten thousand ships, for example. So each one is more and more coveted. It's a, it's you know it's it's an asset um, by definition limited in numbers, right? And with a growing player base, the demand goes up and so on. So it was we were trying to cater both markets and even the whole payment uh, modes thing, being able to pay by. Um, by crypto and also being able to pay by credit card. So it was not like, okay, connect your wallet and pay by ETH. 
right? Because paying by ease or minting is a very traditional Web3, uh, it's a very traditional Web3 lingo. Uh, mint price, how many ease? Again, we don't have that mint price, how many ease? Because we priced our spaceships in in, in USD. Uh, and of course, you could pay, you know, by ETH or you could pay by, by USDT or USDC. Um, but Web3 users also like this um, kind of a, a gambling feel, a whole gamble feel, degen feel to it, where you buy blind boxes, in our case, we were like, no, you choose you choose the rarity of spaceship you want to buy and you get that accordingly. There's no kind of, you know, kick, no surprise element to it because the surprise element doesn't exist for Web2 users. Web2 users are not blind buying blind boxes for hundreds of dollars each, you know, hoping to get a legendary. You're like, excuse me, you know, I, I, pay, I pay money, I pay for what I want to buy, you know. So it was trying to get for, for all markets. And we 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 did a you know we did insane advertising, man, insane marketing. We had launch parties, you know, attended by by um Forbes Web3, we had Farok on shows. Um it was it was crazy. I mean, I think we work very closely with Neo Tokyo as well. I mean, you guys have been super, super supportive. So so huge shout out to Neo Tokyo team, man. Lots of love. Um, and we had an existing community, and you know, being in the space as of early this year. We've been in the space for over two years back then, you know, and 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 we had you know some kind of reputation. You're like, yeah, these guys been building. These guys are people we can trust. But I think that the whole market just just needed some reshuffle, man. I mean, you know, just too many things happening. Um, projects putting pushing out their token narratives. We were out there, you know, we were in this. Sometimes tokens and and NFTs they almost have a bit of an inverse relationship when it comes to market dynamics. So so it was just a bunch of different factors. Um. We also did a lot of traditional advertising uh, or, or traditional, you know, quote unquote, but um, social media advertising, um, Facebook, you know, IG running running ads and, and so on. So capturing all kinds of audiences. I think it was just a very new concept for the market to digest in short. I mean, I had friends reaching out, you know, even after the mint, post mint, and they were like, hey, you know, like, like, I'm not sure when I can mint the spaceships or, you know, I'm ready to buy it. When can I buy it? We're like, hey, it's launched. But then they look at the marketplace, they click on it and they're like, hmm, it feels like a traditional e-commerce model. I didn't know I got paid with crypto in the first place. So it was, it was just all of that. No, definitely appreciate can you sharing you maybe those insights. Um, sorry, Ben, as you were. I was just saying, can you maybe dive in on that more traditional e-commerce model in respect to the ads? Because I feel like this is kind of the one of the holy grails for Web3 gaming companies that most people are just not privy to or not savvy with or however you want to say it. It's largely untapped uh, within the Web3 gaming space. Can you maybe talk about your experiences there, some of the pros and cons, and then um, as you let's pretend you're you're a game and you're considering it what are some of the red flags to avoid and then how do you know it's actually working maybe just do a deep dive there yeah this is a great question there um dan um you know i didn't i didn't personally run the campaigns um but you know we had a team that did that so you know i kind of overlooked and, and understand a little bit about the strategy but i think ultimately when you're targeting you know web to market uh, you have to push out uh, a product or preview of the products out there. You can't just be pushing out tokens or NFTs uh, or assets to a Web2 audience because that you know that wouldn't resonate with them. So what we did have was a sick trailer, like literally kick-ass trailer. I think you guys might have you know gotten your hands on it, um, right? So so it was kind of the captivating graphics, uh, a bit of uh, the sneak peeks of the gameplay mechanics. Uh, and you know, it it wasn't. It was a very. It was very clear that this wasn't some kind of a fundraising mechanism which we were depending on to launch the game. It was like, hey, the game is ready. You know, here's a trailer. This is what you can expect. Here's a launch date. But hey, we are doing this launch of these ships. Um, because if you want to get your hands on them early, you can. You get access to early but pricing because you want to give people an incentive to buy early. You know, I mean, a, a real a real problem for for any company out there is, is monetization, right? I mean, especially being free to play. You know, you already have this uphill battle um, because sure, resistance to to get users is, is a lot lower for for the users for the players themselves because they don't have to, you know, they don't have to pay for anything. Um, and the experience is lovely when they are not being bombarded with ads. Um, but then you have operational costs, right? You have staff, you have development, and you know, gaming is expensive. Web three is expensive. You put them together. I mean, mamma mia, you better have a solid product out there. You better be able to have a war chest to keep the company running. Um, so, so we are blessed. I mean, you know, we're largely self-funded. Um, I, I put my own money into this because I believe in the future of Web3 gaming. Um, but you know, to your point, I think being able to appeal to the Web2 market, you need to have 
a real solid product. It, it can't just it, it can't just be some kind of proof of concept. You know, this is not a um, GoFundMe or crowdfunding campaign. If you want to do that, then it's it's, it's a totally entire it's an entire different um, mechanism and approach, which I can't advise on. Um, but if you want to be able to sell stuff to Web two, it has to be really you know speaking 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 utility. Um, so I think all the red flags, I think a lot of uh, a lot of Web3 projects are not able to do that yet because a lot of them are sometimes still trying to figure out uh, the utility angle of the assets. You can't just ask Web2 users to buy tokens. You can't ask them to buy NFTs. You know, the, the reputation of, of tokens and NFTs yet, it, it's not... It's not a point where the average Joe would, would still embrace it. Unfortunately, right? There's still a lot of speculation. There's been a lot of bad actors. There have been, you know, a, a lot of uh, uh, scams in, in the market. So we need to gradually regain the trust um, uh, of the average user before they can look at Web3 assets as being investment great stuff. For now, you just push the fun narrative. You post, you push the the real ownership aspect of it, right? You you try and leave out the technicalities because um, the average guy on the street who doesn't know about crypto, they get completely frightened when you talk to them about the networks. You know, you talk to them about the gas fees. You talk to them about how to safeguard the assets. They're like, oh, hold on, hold on. I don't even own this thing yet. What are you, what are you telling me about all that? So I think it's also about about massaging the message uh, that you want to put in front of them. You want to simplify things uh, where possible, right? Because people have just such short attention spans. Um, again, I, I'm I'm not a super technical guy, but you know there are ways, uh, metrics that you can also use to to measure the campaigns. So you gradually set an ad budget and you scale it up over time. Um, you have things like you know cost per conversion, you know your your, your acquisition cost per lead, and so on. Um, you, you start, and and I know I know for a fact we start with smaller budgets of say five hundred dollars a day. Gradually scale up to one grand, two grand, three grand, and um, and if I recall rightly, at our peak we were spending something like almost ten thousand dollars a day on on these ads, uh, Facebook, IG, uh, ads, and so on. Um, we had an average cost of two two three dollars a lead. I mean, it's, in some cases it went down to below two dollars. But you know, at a certain quantum, the cost just goes up because sometimes you reach the same eye, the same pair of eyeballs uh, more than once. And I don't, I don't want to make this 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 podcast super dry, man. But these are just some of the technicalities. I like that a lot. Yeah, I think I think a lot more projects in Web three, especially those building games that are historically incredibly reliant on user acquisition, would be very well served to to listen to what you're saying, like have a really good narrative, have a strong product, have a well thought through funnel, have good messaging and make sure all that is synced up. And one thing I might add is to just make sure that you're paying attention to your metrics because you may see that, okay, you have a sexy trailer or something in the beginning and you get a lot of people to click, but then they fall off at some point in your funnel. Well, you can kind of go back and review where they fall off and that'll show you the weaknesses in your own company and your product. And that is what you need to fix. And it's it's that's the hard thing to do. A lot of people like to just assume that their product is really good. But oftentimes, the the hard thing is like the most critical thing. And if you scope out a little bit, tackling the hard thing, like fixing your product, fixing your funnel, fixing your messaging, fixing your branding, whatever it is, by going that route, that actually is the hack. Because you just go get to go directly to the solution instead of having to try to like always be gaming the algorithm and buying bots and trying to fake it until you make it like just bot, just build an incredible product and fix the core blocking and tackling functions of the business. And then the rest of the things should work. Also, a really good metric to pay attention to there is how many customers or in this case, gamers or users are referring their friends or you know, maybe you don't want to say refer, but are inviting their friends to play. If they're not, then that points to either a lack of an, of proper incentive structure to where they want to and where they're incentivized to do so. Show me the incentives, I'll show you the outcome. Or the product's not good enough. But if you tackle those things, then you will actually put yourself ahead of 99% of everybody else in the marketplace who's looking for the quick, easy win. And you'll build the enduring moat of having an incredible product that people will talk about and share. And when they're sharing and referring other people to the product, then you have an infinitely scalable marketing campaign. Because every dollar you put into marketing 
that multiplies because you have a strong referral schema set up and people want to do that because the product's really good. So I know I also went off on a tangent, but I think a lot of people miss that and it's the big obvious thing. Yeah, those are some great points there, Ben. I mean, um, you know, we have to look beyond the superficial numbers. It's not just number of downloads. You know, you want to look at the metrics. I mean, how much time does the user, or I mean, in our case, players, how much how much time do they actually spend in the game, right? Uh, what are their pain points? Where do you lose them? How can you retain their interest uh, further? Um, you know, are they are they spending time in the community? I think a very important metric here is that are these players actually engaged? Are they actually playing? And are they helping our other players? Because gaming is all about a community, man. You know, you want to build those game guides out. And I mean, you know, I give an example in Gate of Abyss. You know, you can choose um, with one of three starting classes, right? A mage, uh, you know, some, some some players are like, hey, what kind of strategy are we able to, you know, do we work more intelligence? Do we work more mind? Do we pump up this, uh, this strength, uh, um, you know, uh, metrics? What kind of equipment do you use? How do you upgrade stuff? Or, you know, like, like warriors, you have different strategies. You want to be more evasive. You want to be, you know, a bit, a bit more offensive uh, play um, and all of that. So another great point you mentioned is, is the whole funnel thing. Um, in our case, with running all the ads, um, we had a call to action. And I think, um, you know, a word of advice, you know, for any founder out there, for any project wanting to do, um, you know, kind of uh, web to advertising, is just really have a follow through with with the ads, like a call to action, because otherwise you just lose those, uh, you, you lose that interest, right? And then you just, you know, you, you're paying for customer acquisition, quote unquote, but you never really acquire the, the customer, the player, the user. In our case, um, we worked very heavily on um, what we refer to as email drips, but it essentially says it's a newsletter campaign where we have, you know, a series and series of emails. I mean, a lot of it, we you want to write these things from the heart as well, because people can tell when you're being real, people can tell when you're bullshitting, you're just trying to, you know, run a sales pitch out there. So we, we write, you know, and I wrote a lot of these letters myself, just like from the heart. It's like, why do we build this? You know, um, why get a base? What's, what's a bit of backstory to it? Why no front? Here, why do I believe that Web3, you know, is, is kind of going to be the new norm for gaming, like Web3 gaming per se, you know, how blockchain can onboard, you know, many more millions of users into the space uh, and so on, right? So every couple of days, you know, users obviously have the choice to unsubscribe at any point, but you're able to retain their interest when, when they check out these emails. Again, you know, people's attention spans, I mean, it's like a goldfish now, right? So you want to keep them, you know, on point. You want to include some images uh, where we're relevant. You want to make people um, uh, be able to feel a part of community. So opening up the Discord to them, opening up the Telegram, you know, being able to direct them, having great customer support. I mean, for I mean, that is something I pride ourselves in very, very strongly. If someone has a question, man, I mean, someone needs help. Our servers has got 24-7 uh, support, right? We have, we have moderators, we have volunteer mods, but we also have paid mods. Um, you know, we just we just really care about our community a lot. Uh, I think, you know, transparency and communication is everything in this space. Wow. I think everybody needs to sort of rewind the last two minutes and listen to it one more time, especially if you're a founder and especially if you have uh, even Web2 call to action. I think that was one of the, the main things. And, um, you know, we do that in, in our uh, advertising and, and reaching out as well. And, and that is one of the most important things. If you don't ask for something, they're just going to look and say, oh, that's cool. But if you say, hey, download this, come to this site, do this, go to this website, go to this Twitter, press this, they'll do it if they're interested. And like you said, the content is good. I want to also talk about what do you think, I know you talked about a lot of things we could do to change the perception of Web3 gaming, but what do you think the, the gamers can do inside of your ecosystem to change that perception to that Web3 is not a scam, it's not about tokens, it's not about money, it's about community and it's about having fun. What, what, do you, what are your suggestions on that? Well, I'm a big believer of action speaks loud and words, man. So, you know, builders got to keep building regardless of market conditions, regardless of token prices. Um, and we've been there, right? We've been there in the highs, we've been there in the lows, you know, just constantly developing, constantly engaging the community. I think the community, especially in, in this aspect, they feel very valued when they feel like their voices are heard, when they feel like they're a part of the game. So, you know, people are going to give feedback, right? Whether it's bugs, uh, you know, whether it's suggestions, you know, whether it's, you know, hey, you know, how can we refine this? You want to make sure they are heard and you really want to implement it for the betterment of this community. 
Um, I, I speak from the perspective of a leader. You know, companies should not, you know, have a, a dominating leadership style structure where, hey, I'm the game master and you play by my rules. It, that's not the way you want to project yourself to be with the community. It's like, hey, let's build this out together, right? We hear you, you know, you are players. We, we care for experience. We love you. You know, we're going we're gonna to try and include this in the update, you know, just rolling out. Um, like for us, I mean, if, if you're a gaming company, you should be having blogs talking about patch notes, talking about upgrades. You should not be talking about token prices and, oh, hey, you know, it's bear market right now. Let's let's just calm down everything. Nobody cares about token prices and, and, and NFT price in the world of gaming. People care about player experiences and, and you can shift that demand, right? You shift the dynamics because, hey, we are, you know, we are, we are past the stage of speculation, right? That the narrative has changed, you know, since the 2021's, uh, you know, kind of the highs. Uh, people want, want real utility. People want real products. So I encourage gamers, I encourage players. So you just, just general users. You want to know what Web3 Gaming is like? Come into a Discord, man. Come and interact with the users. Come and interact with our community. And 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 we want to make people feel welcome. You don't want to ostracize them. You don't want to exclude them just because they're not a holder of, of any FT or, or crypto uh, tokens. And I myself personally, I engage you know, with, with just about any user who wants to connect with me. Myself as a founder, I, I'm 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 right down there on the ground with them. I interact with people real time. There are a lot of founders out there who chuckle of these aside to their team members, and you know they they go behind the scenes. A lot of them they're running projects just because you know they want to raise money. Um, how many founders out there say they've put in money into their own gaming ecosystem? Build this out, you know, no VC funding, man. Zero. I mean, just just really putting the money, building this thing out. Sure, you know, we had some support from from NFT launches and and some revenue and so on. But building games is is, is expensive. Building web free games at another level, man. No, absolutely. Um, I'd love to to tag back on the governance token. Um, obviously, as the name implies, some sort of governance being connected to it. Um, what's the current governance structure from the token perspective? Are there voting rights? And maybe touch upon what the future from your perspective is for the governance token. That sounds amazing. Um, so Tipsy Coin is a governance currency um, you know, of, of, of the, the Tipsy ecosystem. Um, we have a staking mechanism. Um, users are able to stake the Tipsy Coin earn free chain. Um, we also have a passive reward system. So that the token itself, you know, it has 10% sell tax. Um, and when users sell, you know, they have to set this slippage accordingly. At the moment, it's it's on the BNB chain, uh, tradable only on the on the DEXs like Pancake Swap. We have integrated with uh, with payment providers like Change Now and so on. Just try and make this more accessible if people want to buy the coin with their credit cards and so on. Um, but essentially, when you do sell, there's a bit of a sell tax mechanism. It rewards existing holders, um, you know, with with a percentage from the sell tax. So it incentivizes people to hold for long term. Um, and, uh, yeah, man, I mean, yeah, you know, the, the DAO mechanism, you know, we run DAO votes occasionally when we have, um, you know, decisions that we want to partake the community in, but even outside of the DAO system, you know, we do occasionally run votes. We, we want to hear what players want to have, you know, they want, what, what they want to see and feel in game, um, because not all players are holders after all. And you know we don't want we don't want just the holders dominating or dictating the the future of the games, right? We want a collective participation from the entire community. Um, but no, Tipsy Coin is just more. It's more than getting gin, right? It's um, so my theory. Let, let's let's hit on the first point very strongly because I believe this is this is critical here for the ecosystem. Um, if players are having fun the game. And we all have been there. We all have done that. We we spend money in the game just because we feel like it. We're just happy to do that. You know, you buy whatever it's called, whatever currency it's called, depending on the games you play. It can be diamonds. It can be shards. It can be platinum. It can be gold coins, whatsoever. In our case, Jin being the premium currency, it helps you unlock little game benefits. Think of it this way. You can choose to buy Tipsy Coin and get Jin for free. Of course, moving it, you know, between on-chain, off-chain and vice versa. Um, why not, right? I mean, Tipsy Coin being limited in supply. But I think beyond that, you look at being able to use Tipsy Coin um, as, as a currency to trade your assets. So buying and selling penguins, buying and selling spaceships and, and land, you know, on our marketplace, we're going to be rolling out Tipsy Coin as a payment option as well. That's going to take the utility to another level, right? I think, I think that'll be, you know, beautiful to, to promote adoption of the, you know, of the coin. Um, and the staking mechanism is beautiful because it allows users to choose their staking tier 
And even while they're staking their coins, they can still enjoy the passive rewards. You know, they don't, they don't need to, to manage their portfolio on a day-to-day -day basis, right? You buy a lot of stuff, you know, it's, it's a super long-term play. And I believe, you know, you're not going to go out there, you're not going to try and force the narrative of the coin up. You, as long as the player demand grows, people automatically want to find ways to be able to optimize, you know, the, the gin earnings because they want to use the gin in the game for spending. Now, that should be your, your pitch for a token. It's not, hey, well, it's, what's the price going to be tomorrow? It's what additional utility can I get from this token in the game? What does it help me enjoy? What does it help me unlock in the game? So the, the messaging from a lot of Web3 companies has been token prizes. It's going to be about token launches and, and centralized exchanges. We, we stray away from that. I mean, I do believe you know, that that has its own importance and, and you know, that's valid. But I believe you talk about the game, man. You just talk about how fun the game is going to be. You talk about what, what else players can look forward to. You talk about being able to onboard more players into the Web3 world. Because let's be honest, a lot of Web3 games are seeing the same faces, the same names, you know, circulating audience over and over again. We need to onboard more players into this world. No, I totally agree in the aspect that certainly during the bear, uh, I always just imagined like 3000 people sitting at a poker table, just swipping, like switching out ships and such and trying to, you know, get a little edge on this mint or that mint or this narrative or that narrative. So yeah, fresh blood uh, would be greatly appreciated. And, you know, clearly I'm a big fan of uh, gaming being sort of that magic bullet that brings the masses. But uh, I know your morning is uh, carrying on. So I want to make sure we're respectful of your time. We really appreciate you coming on. Um, is there anything that we didn't get a chance to cover that you were hoping we did or anything we left on the table or just some closing thoughts uh pass the mic back to you tipsy yeah no i mean um i think i think it's been great conversation you know we can always continue to go deeper into this uh right it's a little wormhole and something i'm super addicted to you know obviously time doesn't matter to me because i i i'm so passionate about what i'm building and i think you know passion is something you can't lie away through right when you speak to somebody you know you can tell if they're really interested in building what they're building or just they're trying to like bullshit their way through raise some money um, so, so I love what we're doing, man. It's been, it's been my dream, you know, since I was a child to build a gaming company because I was the, I was an avid gamer myself. Um, and I spent a lot of money on games and then I grew bored of titles. I was just like, you know, chucking in the side. Um, and I always, you know, wanted to get into the space, but sometimes you do not know how, you don't know when, uh, and it all just happened. You know, you meet the right people, you meet, you know, great talented developers, it all comes together. Um, as an investor, I lost a lot of money into web three, you know, um, yeah, I just uh, supporting a lot of DeFi projects, a lot of protocols, you know, they made promises, they couldn't fulfill it. So I always believe when we say something, we we keep our word to it. Um, big believer, big, big, big believer of, of customer support and experiences. And, you know, it's just being able to make sure people get a help when they want to. And a lot of times, you know, players who come and join for free, trying to check out a title, they inevitably become an investor in the in the space in the ecosystem because of just you know you 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 strengthen the conviction into the web free world right that's what we need you know we need better players um i also believe that synergy is the way to move forward you know collaborations between chains between um different layers networks and hey man i mean neo tokyo has been super supportive so so huge shout out to the community out there you know we've had a couple of great ama sessions um just, just members in general have been so supportive so lots of love to you guys man i mean it's just a vibe and and i remember the day i was an elite citizen um you know i was scheduled to be the whole onboarding experience being able to be shown around it just it just felt so loving you know it just felt like i was being like welcome back into a very special home um, and I, I, I would love for a lot of projects to, to take the cue on this, you know, being able to, to elevate the whole support, the whole personalized approach. Uh, and I, myself as a founder, I mean, I regularly chat with our members, obviously I don't get as much time as I want to, you know, on a one-to-one -one experience with, with everybody, but I, I do make the effort to, I think that's very important. Right. Um, so man, yeah, we're just unveiling the future of gaming, you know, as, as I've been saying, I, I do believe this is the way to onboard the masses. Um, and you know, I think if, if I were to conclude with something, it'd be, we, we, we can never stop developing, right? Sometimes I have people asking, Hey, tipsy, you know, is the game, you know, are you, are you done with, with developing? Is the game, you know, kind of finished in development? And I'm always like, no, man, you, you can never stop developing game. You can never say my game's development is finished. The game is ready, is done because the nature of games, the players get bored of things. You need to be able to unlock new content. You need to raise the level caps. You need to be able to showcase more monsters. You need to have more gear, you know, have a new kick, a new adventure, a new quest every now and then. You have the storyline progressing and progressing. 
the day a game stops developing is the game is the day the game starts to decline, starts to die, right? So you don't want that, man. Our, our games will always continue developing. Um, you know, come join the community, come vibe with our players, man. I mean, it's it's a lovely space. Um, huge shout out there to to everyone listening to this, man. I mean, um, games are free to play. You know, we want to be inclusive, so you don't have to worry whether you know Web three, you don't know Web three. Just come and have some fun together with us. I uh, love the sentiment, Tipsy. Really, really appreciate you joining us today. Uh, it was great to learn more about what you guys were up to at the Tipsy Company and with both y'all's games and ecosystem. So all best of luck uh, from the AMA squad. Uh, Jared and Ben, absolute pleasure of my week getting to be up here and hosting with you guys. Uh, really appreciate all that you guys do. And huge congrats uh, to Ben for joining the super team. Really stoked for you and uh, what you've been doing. And to the audience, we always want to get your feedback. So we just opened up a new thread in NT in the AMA section for referrals and feedback. So if you've got someone you think is perfect for an AMA or a podcast episode, or just want to give us some feedback, we'd love to hear it. So drop on down there. And this has been an episode of Neo Tokyo's official podcast, Interlinked. And we will be back next week with just more content. Take care, everybody. Thanks, Tipsy. Hey, hey, thanks, guys. This is amazing. Crypto Unicorns is available to play now on their website, and their Play to Airdrop campaign just kicked off on July 1st. Players can now earn daily Xi rewards just by playing the game. Try it out for yourself and breed, battle, and collect your favorite unicorns all while earning your slice of the Xi pie. This is not an opportunity to miss, so hop onto their website, www.cryptounicorns.fun, and try it out for yourself. Okay.